Hi. How are you guys? I am doing well. We are now on chapter seven of Sign of the Beaver, which is quite an interesting book so far. So we just ended chapter six with um, Matt agreeing to teach Atean how to read. So chapter seven. Before he had his eyes open next morning, Matt knew that something was wrong with this day. When it came back to him, he sat up with a groan. Aten, what had possessed him to give a book to an Indian? How could he possibly teach a savage to read? He tried to think back to the time his mother had taught him his ABCs. He could plainly see that brown covered primer she held in her hands. He had detested it. He had had to learn the short verses printed beside each letter. A. In Adam's fall, we sinned all. That would hardly do. To be honest, he wasn't sure what this day, he wasn't sure to this day just what it meant. Oh, he wasn't sure to this day what that had meant. In Adam's fall, we sinned all. I gotcha. He would, he would feel mighty silly trying to explain it to a heathen. And then happily, he recalled another book that he had been, that had been sent to his sister, Sarah, from England with a small picture to illustrate each letter. No nonsense about Adam. A was for Apple. Sarah had been luckier than he. But he had no way of making pictures, and there were no apples here in the forest. What could he find for A that an Indian would understand? He looked around the cabin. T for table, though it was unlikely they'd ever get as far as T. What about A for arm? That was simple enough. B, his eye fell on the leg bone of the squirrel left from last night's meal. The stub of a candle would do for C. D? Door would be just the word for Atin. He certainly would walk out of one fast enough and would again, no doubt, long before they got to D. He doubted that Atin would come. Still, he had better be ready. He stirred the fire, ate a chunk of the cold Indian corn, corn cake, and set about to prepare his schoolroom. He shoved the tool stools together and laid Robinson Crusoe on the table. He did not have paper or ink. He found a ribbon of birch bark in a corner and tore off a strip and sharpened a stick to a point. And then he waited. Atien came, swinging a dead rabbit by the ears. He slung it disdainfully on the table. Thank you, Matt said. That's a big one. I won't need anything else for several days. His politeness brought no response. Sit here, he ordered. He hesitated. I never thought as how I'd have to teach someone to read, anyone to read but I have figured a way to start. Silently, the boys sat down, as straight and rigid as a cedar post. When Matt hunched himself into the other stool, the boy's scowl deepened. Plainly, he did not like having the white boy so close to him. Atean had no right, to, no need to be finicky, Matt thought. He smelled none too sweet himself. The grease smeared on his body, even on his hair, stunk up the whole cabin. It was supposed to keep off the mosquitoes, he'd heard, but he thought he'd rather have the pesky insects himself. He drew a letter on the birch bark. This is the first letter, he explained. A. A for arm. He repeated this several times, pointing to his own arm. Atien kept to his stubborn, scornful silence. Matt set his jaw. He could be stubborn too, he decided. He opened up Robinson Crusoe. We'll pick out the A's on this page, he said, trying to control his impatience. He pointed. Now, you show me one. Atean stared straight ahead of him in silence. And then, to Matt's astonishment, he grudgingly laid a grubby finger on a letter A. Good, said Matt, copying the word Saknis used so often. Find another. Suddenly, the boy broke his silence. White men's book foolish, he scowled. Write arm, arm, arm all over the paper. Puzzled at first, Matt saw his own mistake. No, hundreds of other words begin with A, he explained, or have A in them. And there are 25 more letters. Atain scowled. How long, he demanded. What do you mean? How long Atain, Atain learned signs in book? Oh, it'll take some time, Matt said. There are a lot of long words in this book. One moon? One month? Oh, of course not. It might take a year. With one swift jerk of his arm, Atan knocked the book from the table. 
Before Matt could speak, he was out of the cabin and gone. Reckon that's the end of the lessons, Matt, thought, Matt said to himself. Cheerfully, he began to skin the rabbit. <laughs> oh, he was fine with that. All right. So now we're on to chapter eight, because that was a really short chapter. By the next morning, he was half sorry the boy would not be coming again. He didn't know whether he was annoyed or relieved when Atian walked to the door without a sign of greeting and sat down at the table. Matt decided to skip B for bone. In the night, he had thought of a better way. This book, it isn't a treaty, he began. It's a story. It's about a man who gets shipwrecked on a desert island. I'll read some of it out loud to you. He opened Robinson Crusoe at the first page and began to read. I was born in the year 1632 in the city of York. He stopped. He suddenly remembered. He remembered suddenly how the first time he had tried to read this book, he had found that the first page was sold was so dull, he had come close to giving up right there. He had better skip the beginning and get on with the story if he wanted to catch Atien's attention. I'll read the part about the storm at sea, he said. He read the book so many times that he knew exactly where to find the right page. Taking a deep breath, as though he was struggling in the water himself, he chose the page where Robinson Crusoe was dashed from the lifeboat and swallowed up in the sea. Nothing can describe the confusion of thought which I felt when I sank into the water. For though I swam very well, yet I could not deliver myself from the waves so as to draw breath. For I saw the sea come after me as high as a great, as high as a great hill and as furious as an enemy. Matt looked up from the page. There was not a flicker of interest in the boy's face. Had he understood a single word? Discouraged, he laid down the book. What did a storm at sea mean to a savage who had lived all of his life in the forest? Well, he said lamely, it gets better as you go along. Once more, Atien took him by surprise. What, men get out of water? He asked. Oh yes, Matt said, delighted. Everyone else on the ship is drowned. He gets thrown up all alone on an island. The Indian nodded. He seemed satisfied. Shall I read more of it? Aten nodded again. Go now, he said. Come back, Siva. The next morning, there was no question of B for bone. Matt had the book open and waiting at the part he wanted to read. This is about the morning after the storm, he explained. Robinson Crusoe looks out and sees part of the ship hasn't sunk yet. He swims out and manages to save some things and carry them to shore. He began to read. Once again, it was impossible to tell whether Atien understood. Presently, Matt slowed down. It was discouraging reading to a wooden post. <laughs> but Atien spoke at once. White man not smart like Indian, he said scornfully. Indian not need thing from ship. Indian make all thing he need. Disappointed and cross, Matt put the book down. They may as well get on with the alphabet. He drew a B on the birch bark. After Atien had gone, Matt kept thinking about Robinson Crusoe and all the useful things he had managed to salvage from that ship. He had found a carpenter's chest, for instance, bags of nails, two barrels of bullets, and a dozen hatches. A dozen! Why, Matt and his father had come up to Maine with one axe and an axe. They had cut down trees and built this whole cabin and the table and the stools without a single nail. Caruso had found a hammock to sleep in instead of prickly hemlock boughs. He could now, he could see now how it must have sounded to Atien. Come to think of it, Robinson Caruso had lived like a king on that desert island. All right, that is chapter eight, which was also not very long, so I'm just gonna keep going. Chapter nine, a few mornings later, at the end of the lesson, Matt delayed Atien. How did you kill that rabbit? He asked, pointing to the offering Atien had thrown on the table. There's no bullet hole in it. Indian not use bullet for a rabbit, Atien answered scornfully. Then how? There's no hole at all. For a moment, it seemed that Atien would not bother to answer. Then the Indian shrugged. Atien, show, he said, come. Matt was dumbfounded. It was the first sign the Indian had given of, well, of what exactly? He had not sounded friendly, but there was not a time to puzzle this out right now. Atien was walking across the clearing and he apparently expected Matt to follow. Pleased and curious, Matt hobbled after him, grateful that he no longer needed the crutch. At the edge of the clearing, the Indian stopped and searched the ground. 
Presently, he stooped down under a black spruce tree, poked into the dirt, and jerked up a long snake-like root. He drew from the leather pouch at, pouch at his belt a curious sort of knife. The blade curved into a hook. With one sure stroke, he split one end of the root and then peeled off the bark by pulling at it with his teeth. He separated the whole length into two strands, which he spliced together by rolling them against his bare thigh. Spliced together means he's just connecting the two pieces of the root so it's longer. <clears throat> Next, he searched about in the bushes till he found two forked saplings about three feet apart. He trimmed the twigs from these, drew his knife towards his chest as Matt had been taught to do, and then he cut a stout branch and rested it lightly against the forks of his saplings. From the thread-like root, he made a noose and suspended it from the stick so that it hung just above the ground. He worked without speaking, and it seemed to Matt that all this took him no time at all. Rabbit run into trap, he said finally. Pull stick into bush so white men could kill. Golly, said Matt, filled with admiration. I hadn't thought of making a snare. I didn't know you could make one without string or wire. Make more, Atan ordered, pointing into the woods. Not too close. After Atan had gone, Matt managed to make two more snares. They were clumsy things, but and he was not too proud of them. Splitting a slippery root, he discovered, was not so easy as it had looked. He spoiled a number of them before he mastered the trick of splicing them together. They did not slide as easily as the one Atien had made, but they seemed strong enough. The next morning, he showed his traps to Atien. He had hoped for some signs of approval, but all he got was a grunt and a shrug. He knew, that, uh, he knew that to Atien, his work must look childish. However, on the third day, one of his own snares had been upset, though the animal had got away. The day after that, to his joy, there was actually a partridge <coughs> struggling to free itself in the bushes where the stick had caught. This time, the grunt which Atien rewarded him sounded very much like his grandfather's good. <laughs> Silently, the Indian watched as Matt reset the snare and then they walked back to the cabin, Matt swinging his catches nonchalantly as he had seen Atan do. You don't need to bring me any more food, he boasted. I'll catch my own meat from now on. Nevertheless, Atan continued to bring him some offering every morning. Not always fresh meat. He seemed to know exactly when Matt had finished the last scrap of rabbit or duck. Sometimes he brought a slab of corn cake or a pouch full of nuts once a small cake of maple sugar. Plainly, he felt bound to keep the items of his grandfather treaty, of his grandfather's, plainly he felt bound to keep the terms of his grandfather's treaty. Matt stuck to his part of the bargain as well, though the lessons were an ordeal for them both. Matt knew well enough what a poor teacher he was. Sometimes it seemed that Atien was learning in spite of him. Once, and the Indian, once the Indian had resigned himself to mastering 26 letters, he took them in a gulp, scoring the childish candle and door and table that Matt had devised. Soon he was spelling out simple words. The real trouble was that Atien was contemptuous, contemptuous, that the whole matter of white man's words seemed to him nonsense. Impatiently, they hurried through the lessons to get on with Robinson Crusoe. Matt suspected that the only reason Atien agreed to come back day after day was that he wanted to hear more of the story. Skipping over pages that sounded like sermons, Matt chose the sections he liked best himself. Now he came to the rescue of the man Friday. Atien sat quietly, and Matt almost forgot him in his own enjoyment of his favorite scene. There was a mysterious footprint on the sand, the canoes drawn up on the lonely beach, and the strange, wild-looking men with two captives. One of the captives they mercilessly slaughtered. The fire was set blazing for a cannibal feast. Ugh. I don't think I've ever read Robinson Crusoe, so I don't know the story. <clears throat> and then the second captive had made a desperate escape, running straight to where Crusoe stood watching. Two savages pursued him with horrid yells. Matt glanced up from the book and saw that Atien's eyes were gleaming. He hurried on. No need to skip here. Caruso struck a mighty blow at the first cannibal, knocking him senseless. 
and then, sensing that the other was fitting an arrow into his bow, he shot and killed him. Matt read on. The poor savage who fled, but had stopped, though he saw both his enemies had fallen, yet was so frightened with the noise and fire of my peace, so he's gone, that he stood stock still, and neither came forward nor went backwards. I hallooed again to him, and made signs to, to him to, bring, to come forward, which he easily understood, and came a little way, then stopped again. He stood trembling, as if he had been taken prisoner, and just been to and just been to be killed, as his two enemies were. I beckoned to him again to come to me, and gave him all signs of encouragement that I could think of, and he came nearer and nearer. In token of acknowledgement, near and nearer, kneeling down every ten or twelve steps, in token of acknowledgement for saving his life. I smiled at him and looked pleasantly, and beckoned to him to come still nearer. At length he came close to me, and then he kneeled down again, kissed the ground, and taking my foot, set it upon his head. Thus, it seemed, was a token of swelling, swearing to be my slave forever. Atian sprang to his feet, a thundercloud wiping out all pleasure from his face. Nda, he shouted, not so. Matt stopped, bewildered. Him never do that. Never do what? Never kneel down to white men. But Caruso had saved his life. Not kneel down, Atena repeated fiercely. Not be slave, better die. Matt opened his mouth to protest, but Atien gave him no chance. In three steps, he was out of the cabin. Now he'll never come back, Matt thought. <clears throat> he sat slowly, tur turning over the pages. He had never questioned that story. Like Robinson Crusoe, he had thought it natural and white that the white man should be the white man, that the wild man should be the white man's slave. Was there perhaps another possibility? The thought was new and troubling. Okay, I'll stop there and post more videos with chapter 10 starting, okay? Hope you like it.